Your Excellencies, good morning, bonjour, bună ziua. Dear co-president of the boards of governors of the Paris Conference, Mr. Demare and Mr. Clamandieu, dear members of the board of governors of the Paris Conference, ladies and gentlemen, again, good, good morning. And uh, let me uh, saying that I am very honored to be here in front of you this morning. It is a great pleasure and privilege to be with you today at the sixth Paris conference organized by the International Economic Forum of Americas. I would like to thank Mr. Nicolas Remiard for this invitation and at the same time to congratulate all of you for the high standards of this event. We gather today in the City of Lights, Paris, a space of, of social advancement and economic progress known not only for its beauty, but also for the fervor of ideas, of reflections and international dialogue so much needed nowadays. This moment has a particular personal relevance. In the afternoon, I'll have the first meeting at the OECD since Romania received the invitation to start the process of joining the organization. For us, the stake of joining the OECD is to complete a considerable process of modernizing Romania already consolidated through the integration into the European Union and also through the accession to North Alliance. The reforms that NATO has undertaken, that Romania, sorry, has undertaken in the last 30 years have strengthened our economic and social resilience. This resilience helps us manage the impact of the successive crises that not only our continent, but all world faced and still has to cope with. We have been confronted for many months with COVID pandemic and the transition from the crisis. This had repercussions in terms of supply and production chains. Since the end of the last year, other crises emerged and overlapped. I am referring here to the energy crisis, respectively, the impact of war in Ukraine. The illegal, unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine by Russia determines us to consolidate international action and to deepening the European and Euro-Atlantic cooperation. Romania's response similar to that of our like-minded partners remains firm and clear. Not only in terms of directly supporting Ukraine, but also as regards implementing restrictive measures decided with the main purpose of reducing to a maximum the sources of financing for the war machine of the Russian Federation. Romania offers a solid support platform for Ukrainian refugees, a hub for humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, the most efficient get gateway for the transit of Ukraine grain to the rest of the world, a safe haven for Ukrainian businesses that can and want to relocate temporarily. We do all this with a very deep conviction that by helping Ukraine, we protect our values and citizens from barbarism. However, no government will be able to lend a consistent and long-term support without having on its side businesses and civil society. I invite you all to remain engaged with financial support, projects, initiatives that will allow Ukraine to win the war. Ladies and gentlemen, the lessons learned during the past months is that dialogue, cooperation, 
and solidarity are the key not only in defining our values and way of life, but also in enhancing our resilience. Speaking of dialogue, I would like to insist on the need of avoiding falling into a trap of egotistic isolation. The COVID pandemic become, became a sort of accelerator for attitudes that eagled resilience with a return to protectionism. This is wrong. Though we need to change the paradigm, we have at the same time to maintain open channels and flows between the ones sharing the same values. In Europe, in Europe at least, strategic dependencies such as the one on the Russian gas proved to be very damaging. It is time now to rethink priorities by reinvigorating ties in strategic sectors with like-minded partners. For this dialogue is important. As we cannot establish we-win partnership without negotiations, compromise or definition of common objectives for the long term. Dialogue is not important only between governments. Maintaining a fluid cooperation between government, business and citizens, safeguard stability of decision as well as social peace. Crisis challenge societies and economies, and in, in, in economies, sorry, sometimes to the limits. This is why staying inclusive, keeping open all the communication channels can make the differences between success and failure. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot agree that this multiple crisis, geopolitical, economic, with inflationary pressures, post-pandemic, are a cause for concern for citizens, for the societies we serve. But I wonder, doesn't history teach us that they also offer a framework that allows unprecedented relaunch of some major projects? Aren't they the decisive factor to innovate and bring added value to the supply chain and the products we put on the market? I think that the New Deal carried out by the US administration after the great crisis of 29 shows us that the determination and courage to intervene through all the levels of the state can overcome the greatest difficulties. Mirroring this experience, we can now talk about the Green Deal proposed by the European Union. It is conceived as a tool that not only responds to the challenges of climate change, but also distances us from harmful dependence on fossil fuels in medium to longer term. In the immediate, our main stake is to reduce the dependence from the Russian gas and oil. Since February, the EU has pushed to step on the accelerator and look for alternative energy sources and routes. It is very clear now that the transatlantic partnership does not only have a security and defense component, but also a very strong energy dimension. The United States contributes to the supply of LNG to replace a third of the existing contracts with Russia until the beginning of the conflict. An unprecedented mobilization stimulates the construction of new energy infrastructure to connect Europe to the North Africa or the Middle East. From Romania to the center of Europe, from Poland to Greece, new LNG terminals and interconnectors are operational. This is the most appropriate answer for our citizens who want, to, who want the leaders to act and respond to their needs with determination and ingenuity. Moreover, we have more boundaries to cross. Energy efficiency and energy storage 
sustainable alternative fuels and sources of energy wait for us to tap on their potential. We need to break from the way we design the production and consumption of energy. However, in the current context, facing superposed crises, energy transition should remain ambitious. At the same time, additional pressure on industry and economy must be avoided. This is why Romania continued to bet on nuclear, while our offshore and onshore gas resources will support the transition energy. We prepare our energy transition with a strong preference for a smooth progression. Another important transition for the world, for our continent and for Romania is the digital one. Accelerating the process of digital transformation of the Romanian economy and society is fundamental to develop the 21st century Romania while achieving convergence with the more advanced European, European and global partners. In Romania, we are focusing on digitalizing public services to both citizens and companies. The main obje objective is to contribute to the deep transformation of the economy, public administration and society, increasing performance and efficiency in the public sector by, create, by creating value based on digitalization, innovation, and digital technologies. Beyond our focus on digital public administration and economy, education is very important, not only from the perspective of improving the digital skills at the level of the entire Romanian society. Educational process themselves require the integration of technology transversely. In a digitalized society and economy, the cybersecurity component is crucial. Beyond the national capabilities, Romania will also host the European Cybersecurity Competence Center. This is of particular importance considering the war in Ukraine and the risk of, intensif or of intensified hybrid threats. Distinguished audience, or energy and food crisis, high inflation, are no good news. However, we have solutions at hand. Cooperation, effective public policies, innovative approaches are not a magic bullet, but they offer us the means to adapt and adjust. In the case of Romania, the efforts are channeled towards investments and support of the most affected by the crisis. In spite of inflation and high energy prices, Romania's economy has proved its resilience against this challenging backdrop, being among the best performing in the EU in the third quarter of 2022, with an output growth for this year projected at around 5%. On the longer term, the main factor that will influence the evolution of GDP is the capital accumulation by continuing the implementation of viable, of viable investment projects and starting new ones boosted at a large extent through EU funds. That is why one of the top priorities of my cabinet is to have an open collaboration between investors and the government with a view to find together the best solution for development. I trust that today's dialogue gives us and gives you already some ideas. Please be assured that you will always find open interlocutors and partners in Bucharest. I would like to thank you for your attention and also I would like to um, appreciate that I have the chance to listen what the um, predecessors 
um, speakers have uh, have shared with you, and uh, I will take with me that we have to be disciplined, we have to be cautious, and also we have not to put the eggs in only one basket. So thank you very much for listening, and I I'm wishing you great success through the whole conference. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next panel. This, the title of this panel is Redefining Dialogue. And I think uh, the Mr. Prime Minister did a great job at highlighting the, the situation the world finds it in right, right now, some of the challenges that are facing the global economy, be they geopolitical, be they trends to do with the deglobalization move, the pandemic, the knock-on effects that that has had on supply chains, a whole range of issues. So our topic today is going to be about how we can redefine dialogue. What does that mean? What are, exactly are we redefining? And what is the dialogue that we are talking about? Who are we talking to? I want to introduce uh, the panelists with me today. Uh, very excited to introduce uh, our guests. So we have Cassandra Licknock, who is the CEO of CalSERS, which as many of you know, is the world's largest educator-only pension fund. It is the 11th largest pension fund in the world. We have Natalie Paladitev, the president and CEO of Ivanoe Cambridge, the real estate arm of Quebec's pension fund manager, CDPQ. Natalie is also a member of the CDPQ board. We have Frédéric Udaya, the CEO of Société Générale. And then we have Ingvit Slingstad, the CEO of Industry Capital Partners, an energy transition manager specialist. And prior to that, he was CEO of Norges Bank Investment Management, the $1.3 trillion sovereign wealth fund. So without further ado, let's just get to it. Um, I'd actually like to start with uh, Mr. Udaya, if I can, and just sort of highlight to us how the events over the last couple of years, starting with the pandemic, the ongoing, you know, real pushback in demand we saw right after the pandemic, the war that's happening in Europe, how all of these events have shaped and really heightened the focus on renewed collaboration and global dialogue. Yes, uh, good morning to uh, everyone and uh, I'm very happy to, to attend the, this panel. It's fair to say we have experienced extraordinary events in the last uh, three years, as you've mentioned. First, this uh, pandemic, uh, which was uh, totally unknown, and we had, of course, uh, as a bank, to um, get organized as many corporates, uh, having in mind the, the, the health, the security of our clients, of our staff. But I must say, it was also uh, an extraordinarily intense uh, moment for uh, a dialogue with the public authorities to, to protect, preserve uh, the companies, uh, and I think we did a great job in a very short period of time to uh, implement um, schemes. Uh, I have in mind, for example, in France, the, the government uh, guaranteed loans uh, to ensure that there was a provision of liquidity. And I must say it was an extraordinary intense moment, but I think um, a, a moment of great commitment and mobilization with a, a sense of purpose uh, shared by many people. And, and I think we we did a good job at the end of the day. Uh, clearly, we have faced also a, a, an extraordinary event with this uh, war in Ukraine, uh, which meant again to uh, rethink about, of course, what it could mean for Europe. And there are very, of course, short term elements, you know, just in the winter, shall we have enough energy? At what price? Beyond whether we will have enough gas uh, in the next winter? of course, longer term to shape uh, a new uh, energy mix. And, and same thing, of course, for a bank like Societe Generale, which was effectively, uh, in particular, invested in Russia, it has meant, of course, uh, taking quickly action. And, and I must say, uh, uh, we made the quickly the decision to uh, exit, uh, and I think it was the right decision. And uh, we were, we had the benefit, if I may say, of an organization that we had uh, framed, to be able precisely to be agile in case of extreme circumstances. Uh, and we were able to, to act in a, in a, my view, the best uh, responsible way for, for all stakeholders. So 
it's clear that we are entering into also, as we've said previously, into a new world uh, at the same time for rates. Uh, it happens that many things are coinciding in terms of time frame, and we are seeing this extraordinary change uh, in terms of inflation perspective, interest rates, same thing which needs to reflect. All these elements means, of course, a lot of dialogue with many stakeholders, internal to the company, external to the company, of course. Uh, but I must say, uh, so far, so good, if I may, uh, but there's more to be done. It's uh, needless to say. Cassandra, I'd like to put the same question to you and how you feel the focus on global dialogue has changed over the last couple of years because there are certain trends that point towards an increase in protectionism, countries thinking about their own interests before the interests of economic blocks. How do you read the situation and where does global coordination fit into this? Well, as you stated, Calsters is a is a very large institutional investor. We, um, as of yesterday, have three hundred seven billion dollars assets under management. And our shareholders are quite different than a lot of those participating in the room today. We have one million <clears throat> members and beneficiaries in the organization, and we pay one point four five billion dollars a month in assets. And we're not a we're not a political organization, but we invest globally. And so, as an institutional investor, we are are taking into consideration all of the changes that are ta taking place throughout the world. It is part of our risk analysis that we dive into um, in detail in planning and preparing for how we move forward in the organization. So the dialogue, I think, for us is making sure that we are speaking to our partners, our investment partners, and trying to align our um, interest with uh, with theirs and trying to improve um, uh uh, how we move forward in, in our investment strategies together. And Natalie, when, you, when it comes to making your own decisions, to what extent are global events shaping how you're making your day-to-day -day and also your strategic decisions? Um, and thank you for having me first, and I'm very happy to be here today. Um, you know, talking about your question and the, um, the, the object of this panel and the fact that we use the word transition, I think I have to get back to something which is very important for us as investor is that we can't just stop and, and wait and see. We have no choice. It's not an option to just um, I would say not know and not decide what we have to do. So I think it's very important to look at the world as um, an opportunity instead of just a, a long list of threats, uh, which could be the case if you are in bad mood, which happens quite often right now. Uh, we are in a very, very new period in terms of we have even even invented some words to describe that the uh, Oma crisis, uh, the deglobalization, the reinsuring was those words did not even exist a few years ago. So it's the reality that we have to deal with. So I think that um, you know, I, 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 I talked to the, the 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 chair of Moderna just a few uh, weeks ago, and he said to me, you know, from those crises come the best in terms of innovation. So I'm I'm very optimistic by nature, and I really think that based on that, we can make all this transition an opportunity for the whole investment world. And again, because we have to invest whatever happens. So the dialogue that you pointed out, Frederic, is very important, and I think we have been able to really find solutions and, and things which, again, did not exist previously. And that's why I think that regarding the decisions that we can make for the future in terms of ESG, for example, we're going to be as innovative as we, we were during the, the pandemic, for example. So again, um, uh, stop uh, to just stop and wait is not an option. Uh, we are paid to take risks. So that's true that there are more risks, but Again, we can find opportunities uh, within that, taking into account the fact that uh, we should probably care more to what we do and to, uh, uh, Paul this morning said uh, uh, that it's it's probably more about caring um, and, uh, and about society than ever. So we should at least raise those lessons to do something uh, smarter for the future. Well, we'll talk about the action points. Ingve, I want to ask you about the European landscape, because 
Um, Mr. Udaya was talking about the response out of various policymakers and governments during the height of the crisis, and it was very impressive to see how quickly governments were able to respond with the fiscal stimulus, with the European recovery funds, with the European Green Deal, etc. And then you fast forward a year, and we're in the middle of an energy crisis, and the response has been a little bit more, how can we say, convoluted. Uh, it hasn't been as homogenous as we saw at the inception of the pandemic. How would you describe the current state of dialogue that is going on? Well, you know, Norway is uh, as not part of EU. We are on the outside, but probably sort of one of those who have a bit more feeling for what's going inside the, uh, the Union. I think there is a massive challenge. The energy picture is difficult to fix for a whole region. Uh, particularly the type of energy we, we go towards now, solar, wind, it is going to be more country by country, I think. And so I think it's a different picture altogether. But if you look at the bigger picture, uh, I think uh, we have had an extraordinary um, period with pandemic and with war in Europe, and we're still doing quite good. So in some sense, I think uh, the whole of Europe has been quite resilient. Uh, if you had put this scenario in place uh, three years ago, we would have thought that we would have been in a much more difficult situation. Uh, we do have an energy crisis, but so far it has been tackled quite well. Uh, we have a war going on in the neighborhood. It is, of course, a very challenging situation, um, but I think Europe is coping reasonably well given the challenges that we have. Well, you said the word resilience. Uh, that brings me to my next question to Mr. Odea. How how challenging is it for a financial institution to be resilient in the face of unexpected challenges like the ones we've seen the last couple of years? Well, I think, again, we are living in a pretty complex world and, and effectively there will be tensions, um, there will be uh, barriers, there might be unexpected events. Uh, probably we are living in a, in a world with a shorter and more volatile cycles. And it's fair to say that capacity to be resilient and adapt is absolutely crucial in the short term, while at the same time having to drive long-term transformations which are there and which are massive, such as, of course, ESG, which varies from one company to the other, but for banks, which is a massive shift, as well as still the digital transformation. So you need to keep a lens which is able, where you're able to focus on the short term and in the long term. Resilience is fundamental. It means, in particular, organizing your operations in a way where, again, you can adapt quickly. As I've said, uh, for, for Russia, we were able to, to uh, act very quickly, quickly because we have made the decision to organize the IT systems in a certain way the funding in a certain way. So there are ways to organize. And of course, when I think about our, our, our own operations beyond this, the resilience is around other shocks. It can be a, a cyber, it can be a whatever kind of impact of a flood, whatever. And it's fair to say the, the capacity to have a, a, a way to organize in front of a, unexpected events is something which is at, at the heart of the strategy, definitely, and the organization of our operations. Cassandra, let me put the question to you, resilience, but also in the context of broader decision making, because you are managing a retirement fund, which by definition has a more long term horizon. So how do you weigh the cyclical factors, things like interest rates, uh, so forth, you know, the booms and busts of the economy versus the more long term challenges that you have to think about as well, like aging demographics, wealth inequality, etc. I think that the resiliency and the long term planning is is key to all of the decision making that we make at CalSTRS because, um, you know, our, our member base, again, I'm going to speak a little bit about that. Um, we have really long relationships with them and we have some of the long, longest living demographic members in, in the world. And so, uh, planning for the long term horizon with individuals that have 50, 60, or, you know, plus years relationships with you with a guaranteed benefit that you have to fulfill is a huge responsibility. Uh, we have 438 members at CalSTRS that are over 100 years old that are receiving retirement benefits. And those uh, benefits are core to their, to their financial future and their stability and security. 
So we do take our investing um, with a very long-term horizon and approach. We do an asset allocation study every four years. When things adjust, we do respond appropriately, but we can't change, we can't move the ship, you know, in a matter of days. It's a, it's a, it's a huge vessel um, of, of uh, decision points that we have to make. So the long-term strategy and ass assuring that we can make our assumptions to meet our financial obligations is really the key and core to the strategy um, of meeting our mission at CalSTRS. Natalie, if you could put on your real estate cap <laughs> for a moment, how do you think about assessing the cost of risk in, in an environment where there are shocks like the ones that we just described? Um, we just talked about resiliency. I think it's, it's a lot about that. It's, it's, of course, uh, the way you do that internally in terms of assessing the risk and, uh, trying to underwrite the right price against the level of risk. So it's, uh, I think I would say the traditional part of the investment, uh, job. But beyond that, and especially with real estate, uh, we have to really, uh, it's a big responsibility to, to, to design the communities of tomorrow. And it's where resiliency is a lot about having uh, a purpose and doing things which are meaningful. And it's something which is very key to my heart is really to what I call the uh, real estate solution or solution in real estate. And it's, and it's probably different from what we used to do in this industry when we used to, to, to say build and they will come. Now we have to really build something which is going to make sense in the community. And that's the best way to be both sustainable and resilient. And then to fulfill the purpose of uh, CDPQ, which is of course the same as uh, Cassandra uh, described for uh, her own company is really to um, design a profitable scheme which is going to be um, for the benefit of our uh, um, retirees, the six million Quebecers that we are working for, not only tomorrow but in five, ten and fifteen years far beyond the management of the company. So it's uh, it, it's really the way I'm looking at that. And of the fact that, again, um, the, um, the real estate is very uh, structural in the way you build a world, and it could be also a solution to the uh, big social divide that we see in many countries uh, right now, which is, I think, a, a big part of the dialogue and the transition that you're referring to to this panel. Well, the common theme, and we've sort of touched on it on the sidelines, is is climate change and how companies, global economies can respond to climate change and, and rethink so that in the future, the world is a lot more resilient to these types of, of, of challenges and that we you know work towards a net zero emissions target. Uh, Ingve, I know this is something that you are very close to and you're working at an energy transition company. Um, but oftentimes when we talk about, you know, the targets versus the short term pressures, people seem to see it as some sort of a trade off in that if you work harder towards achieving your long term goals, you're sacrificing something in the short run. How do you square up long term goals with the here and the now, especially when we're facing a winter where many people are just wondering how they're going to pay their utility bills? They're not really thinking about where that energy is coming from? Well, it's obviously a question. I think uh, it was a trade-off between cost and uh, green. Now it's a question of cost and green and secure. And uh, I think the security of energy supply in Europe has risen that top to the top of the agenda for all countries and regions. Uh, and we have to probably act faster. Uh, and probably this has been a trigger for that to happen. I think there's no doubt that if you look at it now, energy security actually trumps uh, the climate issues and uh, the countries will make sure they have sufficient supply first and then look at all these solar issues later. Uh, we have to use that as an occasion for actually re-accelerating all the investments into new energy, whether it's solar um, or wind or electricity grids, etc. And I think that's happening to a large extent over the world now. But we have this issue that how are we going to deal with the private sector and the public sector in this sphere because the private sector is not going to do it by itself and the public sector certainly won't either so with regards to dialogue i think as much of the dialogue between different countries to handle the long-term climate issue there's also the dialogue between the private sector and the public sector that needs to happen to see this energy transition happen uh, mr Dea, what what role do you see financial institutions playing in in helping with this transition 
Well, first of all, let me just say I, I fully agree, and, and there is this apparent contradiction between uh, the short term where we uh, reopen uh, coal plants, uh, we use uh, more uh, fossil energy in the very short term, while at the same time we know that we have to build a different energy mix. Clearly, finance, uh, financial institutions and banks uh, are considered at the heart of this transition in uh, the way they change their way to finance and, and have a capacity to accompany their clients. I, I really believe about uh, the fact that we need to build a transition. I, I, I don't think it. we have to be, on one hand, very, very determined, and we were one of the first banks to say very bluntly, we are going to reduce our footprint in terms of fossil energy as early as 2025. It's not just 2050 where no one in this room will be there to check, by the way. And we have committed, of course, in the very long term, but I think we need to act uh, in the short term. And at the same time, I'm very worried about all the tensions which in, can exist in our societies and the level of understanding precisely in the current crisis, how to explain to someone, yes, we need to use more coal today, but at the end of the day, in 10 years time, we need to exit and we need to, to preserve jobs and accompany the clients. So we have a key role, which is to pioneer also in new technology, for example, around hydrogen and, and, and built with uh, the industry, partnering with, uh, for example, certain sectors, shipping, uh, aviation, to, to, to think about what will work and, of course, what, will be, uh, uh, what we will be able to finance. It's the same, by the way, with emerging countries. I'm very worried when I hear Europe speaking about just what it, it has to do when we think about emerging markets where it's so the starting point is so different and there's so much the, the issue of financing also uh, this transition for them uh, is absolutely critical and there's a need to have public and private cooperation so really a lot is and, and now we are enshrining in our strategy the 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 the, the change i'd like to see more dialogue to be frank uh, and i think at this stage it's not enough between many stakeholders in particular, public authorities and, and, and the private sector, when I say these corporates, but also uh, the financial institutions, to try to uh, align better on what is the right scenario. We, we, we don't have yet the, this, the, the at least a, a, an optimal transition scenario. And also then, of course, in our case for banks, work also on, on the right regulatory framework. Let, let's be very, very prudent and, and try to build something which functions, something which works and something which will be also acceptable in the short term by public opinions. Natalie, I want to ask you about what scope you see for dialogue within private and public to Ingvis point, but then also at an international level uh, when it comes to things like broader regulation in the space. Oh, that's that's a big thing. That's a big issue, and I think it's a again, it's it's where I'm I'm really looking forward to this to use this transition as uh, a trigger to really um, settle this dialogue between public and private. And, and I think that probably uh, um, until now we 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 have thought, and I'm I'm sure Frederic agrees that the the public would rely on the the private sector to solve all the problems. But we can't do we can't do that, and it's a real triangulation between uh, the needs of the communities that we were talking about, uh, the public sector responsibility, and I would say the uh, the private sector um, um, push, and, and the fact that, and, and that's why again I think that as investors we have a big role to play here because we have to deal with the mega trends that we are talking about today but we are in fact structurally designing the new trends of investment as as investors if we want more of that less of that then it's it's going to happen because people would not no choice to just uh to just address those needs and those requirements so that's why I think that it's it's really those three people that we need around the table and to say, okay, what do we do that that, that and how do we uh, address uh, the real problems, uh, taking into consideration that, of course, we are not going to do uh, everything within the next month. And it's it's going to be a long way and we have to 
really look at the horizon and, and have the target in mind, but really achieve step by step to be sure that we are targeting the right thing and not changing our mind all the times, which is, I would say, sometimes the problem, of course, with public authorities because of the, I would say, popularity stake, which is not something that we have to deal with. We just have to be fair. We don't have to be popular. But in politics, as you know, it's it's sometimes different. So, um, you know, we, we recently have, I think, almost an achievement with the carbon uh, tax at the borders of Europe, which could be helpful in the way we are going to really look at these carbon things on the same basis wherever it is in the in the world. So I don't know if it's going to be uh, really uh, legally uh, passed or not. We'll see. But at least we see more and more of these initiatives to try to have common regulation around the world and to really play the same uh, same game and and to stop competing without ourselves, which is very complicated because I agree that the public sector has to play its role, but I think also that private sector has to stop competing within itself and just compete for the right thing as uh, as an industry. And and it's it's what we are trying to do as with CDPQ and, uh, and Ivano to really compete as industries and not only as uh, uh, a single private company on its own. Well, key to that, obviously, is incentives. Cassandra, that brings me to you. Um, there's been a signature piece of legislation out of the Biden administration, the Inflation Reduction Act. And over here in Europe, a lot of policymakers have been quite critical because they think that it will give American companies an unfair advantage. Um, but obviously, if you're an American company, it works well for you because you are <laughs> going to get these subsidies and these sweeteners to help with the transition. I don't know if you have a comment on the piece of legislation itself or just more broadly, how this type of public involvement can encourage the transition. Uh, well, thank you. I don't, I don't have a comment on that piece of legislation. For one, we're, we're a, we invest globally. So, um, the impact is, you know, we have a bigger footprint than just what happens in the U.S. But, you know, I think as investors, we have a responsibility to, um, to influence, uh, you know, change in two ways in investments. One is the size in which we can invest in organizations, and the other is uh, the way in which we can influence change with um, organizations that we're in partnership with. So that's one of the, those are the two areas that we really try to leverage our size in making uh, changes in climate solutions. Um, with CalSTRS has been invested in climate solutions since 2004, so it's, we've been looking at this for almost 20 years, which I think was pretty proactive in the, in the field, and we have a, a, a a function within the organization that has been created and now we call it the sustainable investment stewardship strategies function in the organization. So we are, um, always, um, uh, looking forward to, um, trying to help influence uh, outcomes to improve our climate solutions, um, in the industry. If can I put the question to you on whether you think Europe needs to adopt something similar to the IRA? So if, if you look at it now, you know, uh, China, US and Europe is going very different ways with regards to this public-private partnership. Um, of course, in China, um, they only have 20% um, energy dependency from the rest of the world, although 75% oil dependency. But they have a planned economy, so they're planning for it. It's the government who will decide how this is executed. In the US, um, of course, the US is self-sufficient on the energy side, and they're putting in place incentives, very strong economic incentives, particularly on the tax side. Europe doesn't really have any of those two. It's not so easy for EU. They don't have the tax budget to do that and not the planning capacity to do that either. At the same time, Europe is the worst position with regards to energy security. Nearly 60% of energy is imported. So to pick up on Frederick's point here, um, we really need to put a game plan in place in Europe that makes this public-private partnership actually move forward. And here I think it's necessary to do something that is, cannot be similar to the way that is done in the US, but it has to be stronger incentives and stronger planning than what is uh, currently done. How do you think we do that? Because we've just come out of crisis after crisis after crisis. If a crisis isn't going to initiate the, the response, then what is? Well, I think there's 
obviously an agenda now it's top of the agenda even uh, to uh, to try to fix this and i think there's a lot of things that will happen here uh, we're not insiders to that kind of a discussion that's going on but it's uh, it's clear that uh, that there'll be a lot of policy changes that goes way beyond the green deal that uh, you had uh, one half year ago uh, mr Dea, what do you think the the key actions need to be in order to move forward with a more homogenous, more united, and more collaborative atmosphere when it comes to making these big decisions? Well, first, just uh, by definition, it's more complex in Europe because you have uh, many countries around the table with different starting points, different, uh, at the end of the day, at this stage, interest. And, and I think, of course, at this stage, it's complex because the energy is focusing on the, the very short-term issues, uh, supply of energy in the coming weeks, uh, uh, war in Ukraine. So we, we need at some point, and, and, and it will be the case, I, I guess, to have uh, more bandwidth, the, the, to, to, to focus, really dedicate time to, to build this long-term perspective and effectively monitor the trajectory. Uh, there's no choice anyway. Huh? I, I think Europe has to put its acts together in front of the US, uh, China, and who knows uh, all, all the powers. Now, in our in our sector, can I just say that when I think about our our, our sector and and in order to accompany the clients in in a energy mix, which probably means certainly more renewable with this issue of accelerating the capacity to implement them. Uh, if it takes 13, 15 years, it's a problem. It's a controversial topic, but we are in Paris, let's say nuclear energy. Uh, it's pretty fascinating uh, to see uh, the change of public opinion in France. Of course, it's not always shared in Europe, uh, but it, it seems to me it's part of it. And then, uh, of course, no more coal in less than 10 year and, and progressively le less uh, gas and, and oil. We, if you wish, uh, beyond this and beyond all what it can mean for, for every sector, from my perspective, there is an issue of the financing. Uh, we need to invest and, and, and maybe one of the solution to growth, etc., is effectively this investment. But with the starting point is a huge amount of debt already in the corporate sector, in the public sector. And, and we need to ensure that the financing will be available. Uh, and, and I must say, from that perspective, it's not the bank's balance sheet which will be able to finance the hundreds of trillions because we are in a framework where there will be, it will be even more costly to hold loans. So if you wish, the, the, the capacity to develop mechanism to, to originate and distribute to capital markets and actually to savings is key. We've made no progress so far. There is a need to urgently look at this. Uh, second, I, I think to, to find a, a way to design a, a proper framework. When we talk about transitioning at this stage, I don't even know, and ever, no one knows exactly when we land to a total or whatever, uh, the ENI of this world, when we land for corporate purposes and, uh, and help them to transition from fossil energy to renewable, I don't even know how it is... Uh, and, and, and accounted, if you wish, in whether it's green, uh, brown, half brown, half green. We need in the next three years to design a framework which is common, standardized, and well understood so that effectively it can be audited and can, can, can be used for all of us uh, to monitor our own progress. And it's not yet the case. And, and I think here it's a formidable ground for, for a dialogue because we need to dialogue to between uh, uh, every stakeholder. So the next three years should be also dedicated to that so that from 20, 2025 onwards, we can then accelerate and of course monitor the progress. We are fully determined. As a bank, I don't mind to lose revenues on one side because I know I can make a lot of money on the other. It's a uh, again to have the right framework. Natalie, do you want to pick up on that? And also, when we talk about dialogue, we've been speaking about it for the past 40 minutes, who who exactly is going to be involved in that dialogue? Because there are millions, billions of stakeholders. Every single one of us has a stake in making sure this transition is successful. Um, I would probably, uh, um, I don't want to... Uh, to be too much on, on regulation and, and processes, but nevertheless, I, I really think that we need a, a framework. And 
I'm thinking about ISSB as being maybe a key uh, or a solution to the, the, the discussion we have today. Uh, and not only because uh, the, the headquarter of ISSB is in Montreal, but nevertheless, I, it's, uh, it, it, that's, that's why we're pretty close to their, their, what they do and, and their uh, commitment to really find, to, to find the a real um, framework uh, auditable framework, which is going to be the same for everybody and which is going to be probably the link, the missing link uh, between the private and, that's, uh, and the public. So I really think that it's, it's going to be key. And that's why we, again, we're so committed to make it a success. It's complicated, but we really see some solutions emerging from that. Uh, and, and it's going to be because the I uh, is for international. So I really think that if we have that, like we have uh, the IAS uh, framework for accounting, then it could be a, a, a big progress. So uh, I would not underestimate the impact that it could have. And I really encourage everybody to be uh, involved in this, uh, uh, in, in, in this solution and truly uh, try to contribute to ISSB with the potential stakes and issues that we have to solve to really make progress. So I would I would point out uh, that as being the the potential missing link between private and, and public. And Cassandra, from your standpoint, is it proven that closer collaboration is going to yield better results? Well, I think your question was really the million dollar question, and <laughs> maybe I should say billion dollar question. Um, I think it. I think it is. I think that, uh, you know, we have to try as a huge institutional investor, we have to try to leverage our influence, um, by our investment decisions. And those investment decisions can influence change. And that is through dialogue with our partners and trying to get outcomes that, um, uh, improve, uh, and, and have alternative climate or energy solutions. Um, as a result. So I do think that the dialogue is, is important. Um, and the actions that we take, uh, is also important as a representation of what's, what's valuable, uh, to, to Calsters and what's valuable, um, as a, as a comment to our investors. You know, we, our board has made the pledge to reduce our carbon footprint, um, to go, to get to net zero by 2050 and reduce it by 50% by 2030. And that's a huge aggressive, um, target for the organization um, that is as large as CalSTRS, but that is a target that they're committed to, and we are making uh, strides and, and significant progress towards achieving those solutions. Well, I've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to put one final question to all of you, which is uh, to round up the conversation, whether you're feeling optimistic or cautious that not just the desire, but the actual action is going to accompany this desire to move us all towards a more coordinated response to some of these challenges? I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. <laughs> so I'm, I, you know, I, 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 wherever there's a crisis, that's what drives solutions and, and um, outcomes. So uh, I, I do think that we're going to get to uh, solutions. I see that there's movement. What, what's frustrating, I think that it's, it's it was uh, part of the questions that you had earlier is that crisis sometimes diverts the progress that gets made because, you know, it's hard to think for long-term solutions when you're faced with a pandemic or a war or not being able to turn the lights on because there's no energy uh, source to do so. So that, that's where our challenges are is to, um, respond um appropriately to the to the to the now but continue to think long term for long term solutions um I, I'm prepared to be optimistic because I'm prepared to find solutions. So I, I'm optimistic, but I, I really think that we shouldn't un underestimate the fact that it's going to go, it's going to come with more willingness and more intention. I think we have to be really intentional in the, in the things we do than we used to do over the last 10 years. Well, the CEO has to be optimistic because behind there is also the capacity to act, to develop. If you wish, if you are absolutely somber and pessimistic, there is a risk of uh, just trying to, to protect. But it's fair to say we are living in a very, very complex world. I think it will stay like this with extraordinary number of risk parameters, fundamental tension, uh, fundamental tensions and contradictions. We have, I think, a, as a role, nevertheless, to try to commit as much as we can our energy on these long-term dimensions and 
around this, there is a capacity to to engage, and, and I and I think build. And and I must say, for Europe, to a certain extent, it's under pressure. And when there is a crisis, that Europe makes progress. So there is no choice. And I think we will see progress. It might take some time, but there is no choice then to make certain progress. Uh, said like a true banker, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> Well, so I have to side with optimists as well. And I think for me, it's kind of, if you think about um, the world, yes, we are having a setback on globalization, but the technology will make the more world smaller and will bring us closer eventually. So it's a temporary setback, maybe a decade, maybe a generation, who knows. With regards to the issues we have as a planet, you know, those are to a large extent about the global commons, uh, plastic in the ocean, virgin forests being cut down, CO2 in the atmosphere. So there's global problems. We have to fix them also on the global level. And it will happen. But a long time before we sort of say, well, we're close to it, we have to do a lot of work. It's an enormous amount to build just to change the energy complex that we have. And in the meantime, for the next decade, we're going to grow increasingly frustrated. Uh, but if you think you're going to get there by 2050, yes, I still think that's possible. Well, awareness of the issues is probably a good place to start and then... That's the first step towards finding solutions for them. And the solutions are going to come via these partnerships that you talk about. Uh, panelists, thank you very much. That was a fascinating discussion. And thank you all for listening to us.